Ja, dann darf ich Sie sehr herzlich heute beginnen zu einer weiteren ÖRW IST Austria Lecture. Ich hoffe, Sie gestatten mir an, angesichts der Hitze, dass ich mir eine Leicht Marschallerleichterung gewährt habe. Äh, und ich sehe, viel, viele Kollegen im Publikum sind dem auch nachgekommen. Äh, ich darf vielleicht ganz kurz äh, äh, Sie beg äh, äh, begrüß begrüßen, äh, besonders Frau äh, Christiane nüßlein vollhardt vom Max-Planck-Institut für De De Developmental Biology in Tübingen. Äh, sie hat im äh, Jahr 1995 den Nobelpreis für äh, Physiologie oder Medizin gewonnen und ist Mitglied unseres Forschungskuratoriums seit 2014. Sehr herzlich willkommen. Eine genauere Vorstellung folgt noch. Danke. Es freut mich, Herrn Tom Henzinger hier begrüßen zu können. Tom ist der Präsident of the Institute of Science and Technology of Austria. Und wir haben, glaube ich, vor ungefähr zwei Jahren haben wir beschlossen, diese Lecture-Series in gemeinsame Lecture-Serie ins Leben zu rufen. Sehr freut mich der Besuch eines, eines treuen Gastes bei diesen, Vor bei diesen Vorlesungen, Herr Professor Hans Tupi, früherer Präsident unserer Akademie, Minister für Wissenschaft. <lacht> Er war Wissenschaftsminister, er war Rektor der Universität Wien und so weiter und so fort. Und seine liebe Gattin Erika, herzlich willkommen. Wir haben hier einige Persön Persönlichkeiten hier, deren, deren äh, Arbeiten von Frau nüstlein vollhardt inspiriert wurden, beziehungsweise die direkt bei Ihnen gearbeitet haben. Zwei Namen erwähne ich. Jürgen Knoblich vom Institut, Institute of Molecular Bio, Biology, uh, Biotechnology und Karl Philipp Heisenberg vom IST Austria. Wo sind die beiden? So, ich, ich möchte ganz kurz die Akademie vorstellen, weil einige von Ihnen sind zum ersten Mal da. Maybe I should I talk to you prefer English or German? English, English, sorry, but, but you understood the introduction so far, more or less. Okay, thank you very much. I would like to introduce briefly the Austrian Academy. Uh, we were founded in 1847. And now I have a puzzle for you. We are called, we are one of the four so-called Leibniz Academy. Four academies can trace themselves back to Leibniz, who was famous philosopher and researcher, mathematics, physics, and other fields. Uh, the puzzle I have for you is that Leibniz was here in Austria around 1710, 1720. And he tried to convince uh, the court to establish an academy. He was not successful at that time. We were founded 1847, so 130 years later, but we still call ourselves one of the academies founded by him. The other three are the, the, the Prussian Academy, today the Berlin-Brandenburg, the uh, Academy of St. Petersburg, and the uh, Saxonian Academy. And why are we that? Because typically Austria, Leibniz's plan were more or less in the cupboard, they pulled out again and the academy was founded. So this has a good justification. Uh, we, are, we are both a learned society and an institution which uh, has research institutes. Uh, the academy, the learned society has uh, about 770 members various uh, groups, uh, full members, corresponding members in Austria, corresponding members in, uh, abroad, and, and the Young Academy of 70 members. We have two divisions, zwei Klassen, the Division of Humanities and the Social Sciences, and the Division of Mathematics and Natural Sciences. We have 28 research institutes, 
and two institutes who perform more uh, archival work. Uh, some of our institutes are certainly among the, 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 the world's top leaders in the, in the field. What we also do very proudly is we support young scientists. We have a program of stipends for docs and postdocs, uh, which are open to everyone to apply. Everyone in, in Austria can apply. Uh, there's no restriction as to institution or whatsoever. Uh, this is the only such program which, where people can apply without any institutional support, uh, not their boss, they themselves, and so on and so on. And we just this year, we, we uh, uh, just last week, we decided to uh, this year to have more stipends than ever before because the quality of the applicants was so good. And we, we, couldn't, we couldn't bring ourselves to make a, you know, a cut and not support people who were judged to be excellent. To come, come back to the uh, uh, ÖRW ISD Austria lectures, the first lecture was in 2016 by, by David Gross, and the second le lecture is now the lecture by Christiane uh, Nüßlein forward. With that, I have basically told you what I would like to uh, explain to you, and I would now call upon Tom Hensinger to say a few words and introduce the speaker. Thank you, Anton. Professor Nüßlein Vollert, Anton, ladies and gentlemen, a very wa warm welcome also from my side from, and from the ISD Austria to this second annual uh, URV ISD Austria lecture. Uh, I let me, before I introduce the speaker, let me also um, tell you a few, uh, say a few words about ISD Austria. We are, of course, a much younger institution. We are almost exactly now eight years old uh, uh, since the opening in the summer of 2009. And uh, so we are an international institute uh, dedicated to basic uh, research in science. And we are located just outside, just north of Vienna. Uh, in Kloster Neuburg, and we are funded and supported by the Austrian federal government and by the province of uh, Lower Austria. Uh, the plan for us is to grow to around 90 research groups in uh, all representing uh, all the important parts of science. Uh, that is, of course, the life sciences, but also the physical sciences and the mathematical sciences. Um, and currently, we are about halfway to that goal. We have uh, uh, around 40 uh, research groups on campus and a total of uh, almost 600 employees at the moment. Uh, the, uh, the vast majority of those are scientists that come from over 50 countries. Um, so our, we were founded with two key missions. This is basic research on a world-class level and also the education of graduate students. And uh, so um, th we also take the second part very seriously through our graduate school, uh, which tries to attract students from all over the world. And uh, our third mission is actually an outreach mission in general to uh, bring uh, science also to the Austrian public, in particular also to schools. So I'm very happy that there's, all, uh, again, many pupils from uh, high schools here in the audience today, I was told. And, um, and so as part of this outreach is also this lecture series uh, uh, that we are co-hosting with the Austrian Academy. So now it's my real pleasure to introduce the speaker of today, uh, Professor Christiane nüsslein Vollhard. Um, uh, professor uh, Nüslan Folhard uh, is uh, an honorary professor at the Department of Biology at the University of Tübingen and former director of the Max Planck Institute for Developmental Biology in Thüringen. She uh, studied in Frankfurt and then in Tübingen where she got her PhD after postdoc stages at the Biozentrum Basel and uh, Freiburg. She uh, started her independent career as a group leader at the EMBL in Heidelberg, uh, before then moving uh, to, uh, back to Tübingen, uh, where she became a Max Planck director in 1985. 
uh, her CV, uh, the number of honorary degrees, the number of academy memberships, just to mention here, the, not only the German Academy, but also the Royal Society and the American Academy. Uh, and also the list of prizes is so long that uh, you will forgive me not to go through it. I'll let me just mention uh, uh, just three of them, the Leibniz Award, the Lasker Prize, and of course the Nobel Prize, yeah, 1995 uh, Nobel Prize for Medicine or Physiology for uh, Research in the Genetic Control of Embryonic Development together with Eric Wieschaus and Edward Lewis. Um, so we are extremely proud and honored to have you here today as our speakers and uh, a speaker. And before before uh, I get off the stage, let me just mention two things. Actually, one was already mentioned by Anton. Uh, professor Nuslan Follard is also the supervisor of our very first professor in the experimental sciences at ISD Austria, Carl Philipp Heisenberg. Uh, and uh, she has a long uh, list of, uh, of um, successful students and uh, which which is, is an, uh, a testimony to her mentorship and I hope that some of this mentorship will also transfer through the grandchildren here through uh, also at ISD Austria and secondly let me point out that also uh, um, Professor Nusslein Foll had uh, started a foundation for supporting female scientists especially early in their careers uh, the Christiane Nusslein Foll had found Foundation, and the aim of that foundation is uh, really to help uh, uh, women with children in science uh, by uh, supporting them for uh, providing funds for child care and also domestic help. And this is also very much in line what uh, we try to do at IST Austria, where we also uh, really value diversity and especially gender equality in science uh, with, for example, the efforts we have through our kindergarten on campus, and I think she can and her, through her foundation, this can also serve as an inspiration, as a role model for us. Uh, so uh, let me now uh, welcome you here to the stage, and uh, I'm looking forward uh, to an exciting lecture on the patterns, how the patterns in zebrafish develop. Thank you very much for the in, in, invitation. I, am, I was not aware that there are only the second in this, in this series of lectures, which doesn't seem to be a series yet, but my, maybe now I started it. Um, so I would like to talk today about two top, top, essentially two topics. The one is the function of beauty in the animal world, and the second is how to make beauty, beauty in, the, in animals. And so it will be divided in, the first part will just be on um, uh, the role of beauty in the life of animals, and in the second part I will describe some of the research which has been done in my laboratory, which has been focused on this topic since about five years or so. So we enjoy beauty of animals in the same manner as we enjoy arts and music. The products of arts are made by humans for humans, but how about the ornamentations and melodies of animals? How are they produced? For which purpose and for whom? Beauty is not a term that is used in biology to describe organisms. The strict scientist, not knowing its function, does not use this term because it is related to the subjective response of the observer evoked by the physical features of the beautiful object and cannot be measured. However, beauty of, of plants and animals as we observe it probably in nature serves a similar function as arts in the human culture. Already Charles Darwin has proposed that animals assess ornaments and melodies on the basis of their own cognitive experiences. Darwin, sorry, Darwin is the founder of modern biology. The novelty is that he described the characteristic features of plants and animals 
by natural processes only, not allowing supernatural factors. In his biology, there is no position for a creator. His theory of evolution provides the fundament of our present understanding of nature and has changed the Weltanschauung of men in the 19th century in a revolutionary manner. As a young man, he traveled the world in five years. He watched, listened, investigated rocks and mountains and observed and collected with intensity and curiosity, plants, animals, fossils. Much of the diversity of nature has since disappeared and Darwin had a much more direct and closer contact uh, to nature than is possible for us in the present times. The description of newly discovered plant and animal species at the time was a big topic of biology. On his travels, he realized that not only mountains and valleys have changed in the course of long time periods, but also that organismic evolution has taken place. Already a short time after his return, he recognized natural selection as the mechanism promoting the variation of species. But it took him many additional researches and investigations until he finally published the great volume on the origin of species by means of natural selection or the preservation of favored races in the struggle for life. Good. In this book, he describes how the advantage of survival of the better adapted individuals gradually over millions of years lead to the variation of forms, to the origin of new species, and also to their extinction. The theory of evolution by natural selection is presently undisputed and brilliantly supported by the advances of molecular genetics. A species is a group of organisms that recognize each other, accept each other as mating partners, and produce fertile progeny. The variability of species and consequently evolution is based on three general features of organisms. First, individuals within a species are not exactly alike, but differ minutely in many features of the body as well as in their behavior. Second, such variations appear at random. They are arbitrary and they are heritable, and they are passed on to the next generation. Third, organisms generally produce an excess of progeny, much more, often very much more, than can survive, giving limited resources. This causes a struggle for existence and leads to a contest with the conditions of the environment. As a result, the better adapted individuals reproduce more readily and successfully and pass on their property to the progeny. Inadvertently, this results in the change of the average constitution of a population in the course of generations. Finally, to the evolution of species. The causes of variation and the logic of inheritance were still obscure at the time. Mendel's laws had not been discovered yet and genes were unknown. And there have been many debates whether and how the environment causes targeted variations that may have resulted in the improvement of species. Nevertheless, Darwin postulated correctly that variations are blind and arbitrary. We now know that the DNA, the physical structure of genes, represents an, an abstract encoding for their function. Variations originate by unavoidable errors in copying the DNA during application and are entirely unrelated to the function of the genes. In a further book, The Variation of Animals and Plants Under Domestication, in 1868, Darwin explained the principle of selection. The breeding of plants and animals is determined substantially by the subjective vision of the breeder, and it is quite remarkable in how few generations a selection of rare variants can lead to the development of new races or sports say of dogs or roses, presenting new amazing features which correspond to the taste of the breeder. If the breeder selects the breeding pairs rigidly following his specific criteria. 
When Darwin published his theory of natural selection, one of the major criticisms was that it does not explain beauty in nature, ornaments, colors, songs, etc. These seem to be made by a creator just to please human beings. Indeed, these attributes are not economical, they are expensive to produce, they render animals conspicuous and, are not, and do not seem to have specific functions for the survival. This was a problem which Darwin tackled in a further big book, The Descent of Man and Selection in Relation to Sex, published in 1871. And in this book, beauty is discussed extensively. Darwin does not refrain from using terms such as a taste for the beautiful and aesthetically pleasing for animals. He is convinced that beauty is considered attractive and agreeable by many animals and attributes an important function for beauty in animal life. A quotation from his book. If female birds have been incapable of appreciating the beautiful colors, the ornaments, and voices of their male partners, all the labor and anxiety exhibited by the latter in displaying their charms before the female would have been thrown away. And this is impossible to admit. The way he describes it, beauty plays a big role in the selection of suitable mates in the sexual reproduction of animals, sexual selection. The second part of the book is thus presenting a detailed description of sexual behavior and particularly striking sexual dimorphism, di sexually dimorphic features across the entire animal kingdom. Why does Darwin describe this particular form of selection in connection with biology and descent of man? Man does not have feathers nor fur, which display ornamental colorations in other animals. During his voyage, and also later, Darwin spent a considerable effort contemplating about the nature of human beings, and he also collected and explored numerous observations and descriptions of other travelers about embryonic development and morphology, but also moral features such as metaphysics, prehistory, culture, and demography. In the descent, Darwin argues that humans, homo sapiens, according to the standard criteria, was is it? This is good. Lassen Sie sich. Ich will gerade kein Bild zeigen. Das ist gut. Danke schön. Uh, sorry. In the descent, Darwin argues that humans, homo sapiens, according to the standard criteria of classification, anatomy, physiology, development belongs within the class of mammals, to the genus primates, great apes. He argues that the attributes that have been thought to justify a special status for humans originate from those that can also be observed in several other animals. Human beings, of course, differ in many respects dramatically from other animals. The differences, however, are of degree, not of kind. He does not use man and animals, but he uses man and the other, or the lower animals. For many aspects of behavior, such as tool use, culture, language, reason, religious and moral feelings, he finds traces in the animal world, in particular in great apes, but also in birds, dogs, and other domestic animals he was familiar with. He learned about many aspects of human nature along his travels around the world at a time when he still could meet and interact with several indigenous tribes and peoples whose appearances, minds, culture, and habits he could study. At this time, it was by no means generally accepted that there is only one human species. The conflict between the monogenists and polygenists was based on the still widely distributed of slavery that Darwin abhorred. He proposed that despite the rather different external appearances, only one species, Homo sapiens, populates the world. Important experiences have been the friendship with a black ex-slave that taught him how to stuff birds, and the three Indio kids that have been brought back with a beagle to their home country, Terra del Fuego, Feuerland. They had been taken as naked savages to England and successfully civilized. Their minds and features became very familiar to Darwin, and they were, he recognized they were of his kind. 
Importantly, this conclusion means that the species Homo sapiens is one of the rare species that occupies the most divergent living spaces, from high north to extreme south, heat, cold, mountains, tropical forest, deserts. Their adaptations to the most different climatic conditions, nutrition, shelter, that could be coped with based on cultural inventions of humans. The differences between the geographically separated races are not only based on adaptations to the physical circumstances. He proposed that features that are distinct between peoples are arbitrary. There are, in contrast to common features, very variable. Second, they do not have a particular function or utility. Distinct features, such as color of body and hair, of hairiness, texture and length of hair, shapes of eyes and lips, nose, chin, or skull, are arbitrary, which means that they do not fulfill a particular function for survival and fitness, because otherwise they should have been evened out or disappeared. His theory is that they correspond to ideals or standards of beauty differing between peoples. He proposed that the different appearances are caused by different standards of beauty because what is considered beautiful plays a particularly big role in mate choice. Selection in relation to sex consequently is described by Darwin first for humans because in this species there is a particularly high vari uh, variety among geographically isolated forms. One of his examples is skin color. Pigmentation of skin provides an important protection from UV light. Despite this, indigenous peoples on the same latitudes and living conditions, for example, in the rainforests in Africa and South America, display different degrees of dark coloration and quite different hair texture. Eskimos living from fish and covered in fur are hardly distinct in color from vegetarian Chinese peoples that live unclothed close to the equator. An important feature, though, distinguishes men from other animals. Humans decorate themselves. Darwin noticed in all human tribes that they, to improve their beauty, use paints, tattoos, makeups, pretty dresses, and ornaments. In many cultures, ah, oh, das sieht jetzt viel besser aus als heute bei der Probe. Wunderbar. Yeah. In many cultures. People operate and even damage their bodies to increase their personal attraction or dignity. The mildest form is tattooing, but in many, in many tribes you have very severe uh, in, in, inferences with, with the body shape. Frequently, these cultural attires enhance the ideals of beauty of the own tribe. This manner of beautifying perhaps is related to the fact that humans are conscious of themselves. They use mirrors and are vain. In this respect, humans differ fundamentally from the lower animals. Personal vanity is perhaps one of the few unique features which does not exist in any other animal. Consciousness of the own image may be the foundation of human arts. The oldest artifacts of the Stone Age are seashells lined to form necklaces and shiny golden attires that have been valuable in all cultures. For humans, a female face may be the essence of beauty. Animals do not use mirrors. They do not decorate or paint themselves. And their ornaments, colors, and shapes are part of their nature. Frequently, the males are the beautiful sex, and the females undergo the selection, the assessment, and judgment of the beauty of male partners. Colored patterns play an important role in competitions and in territorial fights between the male rivals the winner has a higher chance of mating or finding a partner. On the other hand, the peacock, which unjustly so, is regarded as a symbol for vanity, does not know that he is beautiful. Beauty in other animals is an inborn trait that evokes good and pleasant feelings in members of the own species. Darwin uses expressions such, such as aesthetically pleasing, he charms the females. Beauty is received and recognized with all senses, smell, colors, ornaments, songs, touch. 
Many animals are in possession of highly developed sensory organs that allow them to receive and distinguish subtle differences in images and patterns. There are no special features of the human sensory system which are not excelled by those of some other animals. Because for the beauty for the animal itself is not necessary for survival, but it plays an important role in mating behavior and mate choice, and thus the number of offspring, which is essential for evolution. The primary function of pigmentation is protection from sunlight. This underlies natural selection as a response to a physical parameter. Sexual selection, on the other hand, is based on aesthetic features that are recognized and assessed during cognitive processes of social communication, which may also be more generally called aesthetic selection. Colored patterns play roles in many processes of social behaviors. In such cases, it needs a spectator, the perception and recognition by a member of the same species, but also between different species, between members of different species. It is based on attributes that are recognized and evoke a response. A selection is evoked by the subjective feeling of the spectator, attractive or repellent, beautiful or ugly. The receiver has to recognize the signal. It can be learned or it, can, or it is an inherited instinct. There is a co-evolution, a parallel development, evolution of the signal and the receiver. Such a process of co-evolution is taking place in all forms of biological communication, including human arts. Several colors and patterns serve functions in hiding from predators, camouflage or repulsion and warning called aposematism. In some instances, the warning coloration is imitated by a harmless animal. This is called mimicry. Now I'll show some examples. So we have the herring, which is protected from sunlight by a silvery layer of iridophores reflecting the sunlight. And we have the cave fish, now I have to check whether I can do this. Yeah, the cavefish, Astyanax, is both blind and colorless. It cannot be seen and it cannot see. Um, camouflage is shown by a flounder whose pigmentation adapts to the background, both in intensity of coloration and in the texture. And uh, if, they are, if they are on an even background, they are also evenly colored. And they are very difficult to recognize in this condition. And an un example of aposematism of signaling poisonous, uh, that they are poisonous, is, is, is this lionfish, which uh, fish, when they have once encountered it, they recognize it when they encounter it a second time and don't, don't uh, uh, attack it anymore. Other, other, uh, Recognition of uh, other examples for, for patterns which are involved in social behavior are recognition of kins, which, al always, uh, which very often involves uh, a colored pattern. And um, these colored patterns are particularly interesting as triggers for innate instinctive behavior, com serving communication within species, formation of shoals and swarms, in territorial fights, and sexual attraction. An example is an amazing pigmented fish is the Picasso fish. This is one of the coral reef fishes, which you probably, some of you which have been snorkeling um, uh, in the Caribbean or so, have, have seen these amazing patterns, which are com incredibly colorful and, and have very strange ornamentation. In this case, these fishes are monogamic. They, they, they live in territories, just a pair of fish, and they they uh, fight away everyone who comes into this territory if, it, if this other fish has the same pattern. So the pattern evokes territorial fights among rival, rivals as competitors for the same prey. Other patterns are for these fishes completely irrelevant. And then we have another uh, function of color patterns to recognize each other in the formation of sh shoals and schools of fish 
and these have the function that it's very difficult to catch one individual in in such a large swarm of, of fishes and uh, the color pattern if make the fish recognize each other that they form these flocks. Um, color, color patterns play a big role in sexual attraction. In his, this is a famous example investigated by Nico Tingbergen, the red throat of the male stickleback. It evokes fighting behavior among neighbors. Uh, they are also live territorial and attracts the female to the nest that has been built by the male and who is also attending the brood. So I'm now at the end of my introduction and it just come to the, to the question of how are these patterns made. The amazing patterns which we see in animals often resemble human art, which you have seen in these examples. However, the means by which colors and patterns are created have many similarities with painting a picture. In fishes, layers of silvery, yellow, black, and red pigmented cells are superimposed. Reflective and shiny textures resembling gold and silver are produced by nanostructures that reflect light at different angles and are inbuilt into feathers and birds or pigment cells in fishes. Green and blue colors are produced by a combination of pigments and nanostructures. So I will now, after having commented on how, what color patterns are good for, focus on their organization and development. So how, how are color patterns organized? In insects, which also are very beautifully colored, beetles, you know beetles and you know butterflies, uh, the epidermis is a two-dimensional sheet of cells and the epidermal cells themselves produce the, the color. And so pattern formation, uh, the pigment cells, the pigments are produced in these epidermal cells and secreted into the cuticle which is covering uh, the, the external uh, surface of, of insects and other, uh, and other arthropods. Pattern formation takes place within a two-dimensional sheet of cells according to the generally accepted rules of morphogenesis, gradients, and, and signal, uh, signal transduction pathways. Um, and often they follow structures uh, morphological structures, morphological pre-patterns, which you can see in the, in the case of butterflies where the dark pigment here is lining the, the, the veins of the, of the wing, and uh, here similar uh, other patterns which are a bit more complicated. And you see also here that this is a, the, the wing is a, a two-dimensional sheet of cells, and each cell produces a scale, and you see that the pattern is is composed of a mosaic of individual cells, of individually pigmented uh, scales. Each scale has a different color, or has one, just one color. And this is really very pretty and a very elaborate way of making the pattern. But the basic principle of the pattern forming process is, is morphogenesis, as we know it, in two-dimensional sheets of cells. In uh, vertebrates, on the other hand, the color, the pigment is made by special pigment cells, not by the, by the skin cells themselves, but by uh, cells which migrate into the skin and are pigmented, carry the pigment. In birds and mammals, there's just one cell type, the melanocyte, which produces black or brown pigment, melanin, and this is secreted into the hairs or into the feathers or into the skin. In Lower animals, such as or basal vertebrates, such as amphibians, fishes, and reptiles, there are more than one cell type. There are three, three and more cell types. Um, melanophores producing black melanin, xanthophores producing yellow pteridin-based pigments, and iridophores, which have um, guanine platelets, which reflect the light uh, and are included in, in also in, in, in little organelles. The pigments themselves are included in organelles, particles, uh, membrane-bound organelles which are in, within the cell and can be shuffled uh, around in the cell, uh, changing the color, and I will show you uh, illustrations. So we have three basic cell types, melanophores producing black melanin, danzophores produce yellow or, red, or uh, orange or, uh, organic pigment, and iridophores, uh, these guanine platelets. The principle of 
seeing the different patterns and colors is based on the super, super, superposition of three layers of pigment cells. The outer layer is the xanthophores, the basic layer is, is reflected the radiophores, and we have the melanophores as the basal layer, which provides a dark color, and they are covered by these iridophores, which reflect the light, different angles, and then on top we have the xanthophores. And together, these cell types can form amazing patterns if the, the shape of the cells are ch and their pigmentation is slightly changed. For example, in the zebra fish, in the dark stuff, we have these three cell types superimposed, uh, and the light, uh, the silver, the iridophores, and the xanthophores acquire a very uh, uh, stellar shape, whereas in the light stripes, we have very compact and big xanthophores making the stripes golden, and I will illustrate that in a moment. So we investigate uh, pattern formation, uh, pigment pattern formation in the zebra fish, which is a vertebrate model organism which has been developed uh, starting from the work of George Streisinger and Eugene in Oregon. And we have uh, started this to work on this in the 90, early 90s. And since then, we have uh, um, concentrated on several different aspects of biology of zebra fish and recently focused on the on the amazing pattern these fishes produce. And they are beautifully striped, uh, longitudinal parallel stripes of blue and golden cells. The females are silvery, the males are more yellow or golden. Um, and this, the stripe pattern is not sexually dimorphic, so they, the, the sexes recognize each other uh, by the, the yellow coloration of the, of the males. This is a sexual attractive feature in this case. Uh, the, 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 the reasons why zebrafish is such a successful model organism is based on uh, external development. The eggs are shed by the female and, uh, and develop entirely outside the female organism, so they can be observed and followed through development at all stages without interfering with the mother. And we can apply genetic analysis. We can, uh, with fa fairly easily, uh, isolate mutations in particular genes. Uh, affecting development and also the pattern. And this gives us a direct access to the molecular basis of, of these processes. If we, uh, if we identify the, the gene product, we can uh, know which, which proteins, which um, pathways are involved in particular processes. And the stereotype pattern is just a good means to investigate it because we can easily recognize deviation from this pattern which might be caused by mutation. And what I find one of the most recent sort of highlights in our research was that we recognized that closely related species within the genus Danio have very different patterns. And these, uh, these re closely related species are so close that you can still make hybrids between them but they have an enormous variety of different patterns. Though the closest relative of zebra fish, which is longitudinally striped, is actually this fish, Esculapi, which has vertical bars instead of horizontal stripes. And there are fishes which have dark spots on a light background and fishes which have light spots on a dark background. And many show divergent patterns in the fins compared to the body and they often acquire this red coloration, which is very attractive in fishes, in male fishes, attracting the females. So this is a good example of beauty in, 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 in animals, I think. And the big question we have is, how do you get from one pattern to the next? Which genes are involved in providing this variety? And we learn from these, from these, from these fishes that there might be only a few set of genes, and we can maybe identify them by comparing the fishes uh, to, to, with each other. And this is something which I come back to at, at the end of my, of my talk. So the pattern is composed of blue and golden stripes. And I, as I have already mentioned, these stripes uh, are formed by superposition of three, three different cell types. This is the distribution of the xanthophores compact and densely, densely packed in the light stripes, underlined by a very dense uh, epithelial layer of, of whitish iridophores, producing this, this, this golden coloration. And in the dark stripe, we have the melanophores, which are only present in the dark stripes. And on top of them, um, 
migratory iridophores and, and stellate xanthophores, which are uh, giving the the, blue, the black of the melanophores a blue cast and, 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 and a shininess, which you, which you can also see here in this, in this bigger picture. We can investigate the shapes of these cells better when we label them with, with fluorescent transgenic, uh, with, uh, in transgenics with fluorescent uh, proteins. In this, in this case, you see these compact uh, xanthophores and these stellate xanthophores in, on top of the melanophores in the dark stripe, the very compact iridophores making this dense arrangement in the light stripes, and you see also the melanophores in the dark stripe, which extend these protrusions contacting the cells in the light stripe. So the exact shape and positioning of these cells is important for the, for the correct uh, patterning. We also observe, uh, and I've mentioned this already, we observe a physiological change of intensity and coloration. The melanophores and also the xanthophores can shuffle the, the, the pigment carrying um, organelles within the cell along microtubuli to the center. And when they shuffle them into the center, they get very light. The whole pattern is lightened. And when they expand their, 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 the melanophores in these cells, then they get very dark. And this is uh, the trick which many f fishes and also amphibian and reptiles use for color changes, such as the chameleon. They just transport the melanin in these melanosomes within the cell and therefore adapt, can adapt to the background of the uh, surface, such as the flounder, or they can also improve the brilliancy of their patterns. And this is controlled by hormonal and electrical and nervous uh, stimuli. In fishes, sleeping fish are light, blind fish are dark, and they can also change these colors. So zebra fish has a life cycle of about three months. Um, the fish uh, lay uh, very large numbers of eggs with every two weeks or every week or so, about 200 or so eggs. And these eggs hatch in, from these eggs, uh, larvae hatch in, in, in two days, and then they're very small and they eat and they increase in size. And uh, in, at, at about three weeks, the, the pigment cells which produce the stripe pattern appear in the skin of the fish. And we call this period from three to, to three weeks to six weeks or so metamorphosis. And it's the period in which the fish change their shape pretty dramatically. The, the fins appear, the, the adult set of fins appear. Uh, and also the scales appear at this time, and also the, the stripe pattern is formed. Here you see still the remnants of the larval pattern, but here you already see these stripes forming, and about two, two months or so, we have the full set of four light and four dark, dark stripes. Where do these pigment cells come from? I mentioned in the insects, they are part of the skin themselves, the skin cells itself. In, in the zebra fish, they come uh, in fishes, they come from the neural crest. The neural crest is an embryonic structure, uh, an embryonic tissue, which is uh, vertebrate specific and located at the dorsal neuroectoderm. And you see here a transection uh, of, a, of, a, of an embryo at this stage where the neural tube in, invaginates. And at the margin between the neural tube, anlage, and the epidermis, these cells are the neural crest. And they uh, are cells which then um, undergo an, an epithelial mesenchymal transition and migrate into the body to provide the body with many structures uh, which are specifically coming from the neural crest, including uh, bones of the head, uh, um, uh, including, for example, the bones of the head, uh, the peripheral nervous system, but also all the pigment cells of the body. Um, I just show you. Um, a movie how this embryo, the zebrafish develops uh, from the ball of cells which is dividing asynchronously and then forming in gastrulation, the, in, the cells start infolding, making the germ band with the tail appearing here and the head appearing here. You see the eye forming here and then the somites as mus the musculature here, uh, somatic cells. And the neural crest is now uh, at this time is, is, are these cells which are located here at the invaginating neural tube. And you see that better in the next slide where they 
start getting migratory and migrate in streams, segmental streams from the crest into the, into the, into the body. And you see that there, there are big cells which stay behind and other cells migrate along these streams into the body. And so the pigment pattern of the lava, which is very simple, has just three rows of dark cells uh, uh, at, the, at the dorsal side, at the lateral side, and the ventral side, um, is very simple. Uh, and the adult pattern arises only um, at three weeks of development, as I mentioned. And at this time, the neural crest has long disappeared. The cells have migrated. So it's a big question, where do the pigment cells come from, from the adult? Although we know from the, in the lava, these pigment cells just migrate to the site where they form these rows, and this is it. But the adult pigment cells, for a long time, it was not clear where these pigment cells come from. Until a couple of years ago, we found that they come from stem cells, uh, which are deposited early in development. And um, well, in order to find out where pigment cells come from, you have to do lineage tracing. You have to label individual cells early in development and follow them through development and see what they end up with. Or you come back from the differentiated cells and trace them back. And there are many tricks which you can apply with labeled fluorescent dye labeled uh, cell lines or so. And I just want to illustrate this in two cases. This is um, cell lineage tracing when you transplant cells from a labeled donor embryo. In this case, um, the transgenic is labeling just the xanthophores and the xanthophore precursors. And when we transplant a couple of cells into an, an unpigmented embryo, um, you can trace the progeny of this uh, cluster of cells into uh, to the development. And this has been done, in this case, an experiment by Brigitte Walderich. In this case, the, the cluster of cells provided four labeled or six labeled uh, xanthophores. At four days, you see them stellate cells in the skin of the, of the lava. At 16 days, there's still the same number of, 16, uh, of these six cells. Um, but at 28 days, these cells have multiplied and have divided. And, and here you see that the xanthophores apparently divide. And uh, this is a cluster of these xanthophores. And they spread and will cover the entire skin coming from the larval xanthophores. In contrast, the iridophores and the melanophores, they come from stem cells. And this is an outline of how these stem cells originate from the migrating neural crest. The cells migrate in two roots, an inner root and an outer root. And along this inner root, one cell stays behind uh, while the other cells migrate on, following the nerves, the neurons, which are also extending at this time of development. And these cells will be the, the stems, will, will give rise to the stem cells of the neural crest. Here you see a time-lapse movie in which the neural cells are labeled in red. This is the spinal cord. And the, uh, the neural crest cells in green, and they migrate along these these motor neurons, which extend uh, during this time of development. And there are cells which are left behind, and these are the stem cells. And we can uh, uh, trace them. Uh, so here at four days, you see these cells, big cells, non-migratory cells. These are migratory neural crest cells. And at later stages, you can see here that these neural crest uh, stem cells uh, are are located at the dorsal root ganglia. These are ganglia of the peripheral nervous system, which harbor these, uh, no, the stem cells are part of these dorsal, dorsal root ganglia. And uh, then these no, these pigment cell progenitors migrate along these nerves, which then innervate the skin. And this is the way they reach the skin. And we can look at it in a cross section. So we have in a cross section, we have these dorsal root ganglia, the stem cells of the pigment cells, and then the pigment cells migrate along the neurons into the skin and populate the skin. So it quite differently from the xanthophores, which are already present in the skin. And uh, amazing, yeah, and then, then they come into the skin. And then the question is, how do, they, how do they make this pattern? So we just can look at this and observe it in more detail. So here you see the neural crest. Um, cells emerging, and the first cells which are emerging uh, at uh, three weeks of development are the iridophores, they emerge in segmental clusters, um, and then a proper, 
proliferate in the skin. These are iridophores labeled in red by SOX10, RFP, and in green by another transgenic. And uh, they proliferate in the skin and make, make this first light stripe, which very densely packed uh, epithel uh, epithelial layer of, of densely packed iridophores. And uh, the resolution also shows you these crystalline guanine platelets here in, well, it's not so well seen, but one can see it a little bit better in this dark field picture where you also see the outline of this epithelial sheet of iridophores. What you also see, and this is even better to see here, that at the margin of this light stripe, the iridophores change their shape and get migratory and stellate, and they proliferate, continue to proliferate and migrate out uh, dorsally and ventrally and spread over the, the skin. And, um, and in order to follow this, this, this migration and to see how the pattern is then formed by, individual, uh, pro, by the progeny of individual stem cells, um, Ajit Singh in the lab de developed a method to, uh, to Crelox label individual pigment cell progenitors uh, in early and later stages of development. So uh, this method is complicated. I don't want to explain it fully, but people who know um, Kalox induced meritotic recombination know, uh, understand this. It's, the principle is you, you, you label a single cell at early stages in development by um, inducing it to make red pigment. And from this time on, the progeny of the cell will, will produce this red pigment, and you can follow them as clones through the, the development of the animal. And at the end, a clone which has been induced in early development in the neural crest cell will give rise to a whole stretch a catch of cells which in this, within the skin. And in this manner, you can follow the development of the, the stripes in, the, in, in vivo. And uh, Ajit, the problem with in vivo is, of course, that the fish are small and they swim around, and it's not so easy to, to fix them and to make time-lapse images as you can do it with embryos. You have to be very careful, and, and uh, the, the development is slow. So Ajit Singh developed methods to, in, to immobilize the fish by, by an aesthetics um, and, yeah, and, 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 and it, make pictures every day of development and follow them through several months of development by being very gentle and letting them survive and, and show how, how these clones develop. And here is a clone which has been induced in uh, four days of development or so, and you see this is the DRG uh, labeled, and you see the progeny of the cell, and there are neurons which are labeled, and there are also pigment cells are which are labeled. This is one clone shown at 17 days uh, after the, the fertilization and here at 26 days at the beginning of metamorphosis. And you see these cells m originate at the horizontal myoseptum, separating the, as we've seen before, separating the dorsal and the ventral myotome, uh, muscle, muscul musculature, and they ar uh, appear here at this side and proliferate further. And when you observe this particular clone further in development, you can see that the cells divide, making this dense light stripe, and then here they get stellate and spread further and di while dividing. And at a certain distance from this first light stripe, they produce a second. Let's just show this again because it's, um, it's a bit quick. And you see also two melanophores which sit here. And interestingly, the melanophores do not divide at all when they're in the skin, whereas the iridophores divide and spread and form these stripes in a successive process which we call pattern aggregation at a particular distance from the light, first light stripe, they aggregate. Whereas the melanophores just fill in the space. So we see a big difference between the iridophores and the melanophores and the xanthophores, in fact, which I have shown you already. So when we induce these clones very early in development, we, we can see that the entire pattern from dorsal to ventral may be labeled. So one stem cell, which is labeled at, 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 at the time when the neural crest starts migrating, can provide all the pigment cells along the dorsal ventral axis. When the clones are induced a little later, they are smaller, but they are also spread quite long stretches. But they are always oriented 
uh, ver uh, vertically, not horizontally, so they do not follow the, the stripes at all. They just follow uh, the dorsoventral axis. And this is probably related that they originate from the stem cells which, and are propagated along the, the neurons which are segmentally arranged. And only in later stages when we induce the cells rather late, we get uh, induction of clones in already differentiated cells and we see that this is an iridophore clone where an iridophore has been labeled and indicates that the iridophores are capable as dividing when they're already differentiated in the skin and this is also true for the xanthophores whereas the melanophores only form only single cells clone when induced late. So the, the lineage relationship is that we have the multipotent neuroquest cell which gives rise to a, a pigment cell precursors which produce all three, stem cell, uh, all three types of pigment cells. Uh, the pigment cells are always mixed in, or mixed in, in, in composition. They are not single iridophore clones or malonophore clones, and, but they're always mi mostly mixed clones producing all three cell types as well as neurons and glia. So importantly, there is no segregation in precursors for the different cell types, but it, um, it, it, it's a mixture of all cells which are produced by these, by these progenitors uh, of the uh, a multipotent, uh, multipotent stem cells which produce uh, these, uh, these three different cell types. Uh, and um, in the iridophores can also divide when they're differentiated, and the xanthophores also can divide when they're differentiated, whereas the malinophores immediately differentiate when they come from these mixed uh, stem cells. So the pattern which we see here is stitched together by clones of different sizes and shapes, and it's quite um, interesting that there are no morphological restrictions. They do not follow the stripes, nor do they follow the, the, the scales or other, other features in the body. They just, uh, um, they just f f fill this pattern in an irregular manner, apparently adjusting to each other when they see that there is already a cell that they don't divide anymore. And uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a plasticity of proliferation and specification. And the orientation, dorsoventral orientation, apparently comes by, the, by homotypic competition between cells coming from neighboring segments. And we have experiments showing this definitely, but we, uh, I don't have time to, to go into this. So the summary is that the pigment cells arise from multipotent stem cells. These are located in each segment at the dorsal ganglia. The three cell types behave very differently, and there is no morphological restriction of the clones. They are just filling the, filling the space, and the competition between cells regulate the spreading. And we think that this way of covering the skin from the neural crest with these pigment cells is probably a common mechanism, and it just provides this, this general layout of the three pigment cells in, in these three superimposed layers. But how does the pattern arise? And we don't know that. And the question is, for the stripes, is there any, any, are there any signals? Are there something which comes from the larva orienting or sort of pre-patterning pre the, the stripes? And we found, we found one, but only one uh, uh, feature. And this is the horizontal myoseptum. This is the structure which separates the dorsal and ventral part of the, of the myotome and uh, along which the iridophores appear first, which I have shown you before. We have a mutant which is called Choker, which was isolated in the screen for embryonic mutants in which Carl Philipp Heisenberg also participated. And this mutant was isolated on the basis of the missing structure here and we managed to grow up these fish to adulthood and found that they don't orient the stripes in a longitudinal manner, but in a random orientation. They make a meandering pattern, and this indicates to us that the horizontal myoseptum has the property of orienting the stripes along the longitudinal axis of the fish. Other than that, uh, and if the structure is missing, the stripes are still forming, and they're also forming in parallel correct arrangement with correct composition and, 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 and widths. And this indicates to us that the type formation is a self-organizing process. It just requires these three cell types, and when they come together, they make, they form, form stripes in a magic way. And each of these choker fish looks differently, and it seems to be that 
somehow where the iridophores come out first, uh, the stripes uh, are made. Other than that, we do not know anything. And of course, when you look at these stripes, you think immediately of wavy patterns and of morphogens in making, making waves or so, and of reaction diffusion. Um, models and, uh, in fact, a, a Japanese group around uh, Shigeo Kondu has long propagated a, a reaction diffusion model for making stripes. In his model, he just assumes that the stripes are made just by melanophores and xanthophores, and further, the melanophores and the xanthophores sort out in early development when, while they make the stripes. We do not observe the sorting out. We do not observe that the melanophores migrate at all. They just come and stay where they are put. So this model is, is not explaining how the stripes are made. But what is more, more um, uh, interesting or what is more irritating about this model is that they do not take the iridophores into account at all. Um, because they thought the iridophores are present in both the light and the dark stripes, so they cannot have anything to do with the stripe pattern. But this is probably not true, because we know now when you do not have iridophores, you do not get enormous stripe patterns. And in fact, this evidence comes from mutants which lack one of the three cell, cell, cell types. And this is the wild type fish with all these three cell types and beautiful horizontal light and dark stripes. This is a mutant lacking the melanophores. This is a mutant lacking the xanthophores, and this is a mutant lacking the iridophores. And you see in all three cases, the two remaining cell types do not form, do not arrange in their, what they normally would do in the, the complete pattern, but they form irregular rudimentary uh, striped arrangements. Here they break up into spots and, uh, and they mix. And in iridophore, or in the mutant which lacks iridophores, you have much fewer melanophores than normal, and you do not form the proper stripe pattern here either. In iridophores, you do have normal striping in the fins, but not in the body. And uh, this, is, uh, this is highly significant. And if, if you do not take all three cell types into account, you cannot explain the, the striping pattern. So this iridophore mutant shady has much fewer melanophores. And the fins are normal. And you can, of course, argue maybe the mutant is not just affecting the iridophores, but also the melanophores. And in order to test that, uh, we showed that by transplantation of uh, cells from cells with, uh, from embryos which can only make iridophores into a mutant which cannot make iridophores, you can restore a normal pattern at the site where these iridophores have been introduced. And this means that the lack of melanophores in this pattern is not because the melanophores are defective, they are perfectly fine if they are provided with iridophores. And you can also do the reciprocal experiment and show that in the mutant, in the mutant background, when you introduce, which doesn't make stripes, just iridophores, when you introduce melanophores and, and xanthophores, they make also normal stripes here. So this means that all three cell types have to interact in a manner which is complicated. And from the mutant analysis, we know now several such interactions between the different cell types. And it's quite complicated. And we have to sort that out. And uh, this is just the, this is the, presently the situation where we are now. And then you, you and, 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 and this, these interactions explain, should explain why the cell types change uh, when they are um, in these different uh, positions in the body. So in summary, we, we know that the homotypic interactions uh, which I've shown in the clonal analysis uh, provide the, uh, regulate the proliferation uh, of, the, of the pigment cells and the heterotypic interaction between the different pigment cells, they, they are required for making the pattern to precisely form the shapes and the superimposition of the different cell types. And the big question is now, which genes and molecular mechanisms are involved in the action, interaction between these three cell types? And in, for this, uh, to analyze this, we have to look at mutants which have all three cell types and despite that do not have a normal pattern. And we have isolated several such mutants which uh, either have uh, broader stripes, irregular, uh, but broader stripes in general, and some which have a spotted pattern where the, the stripes break up into spots and cannot form properly. And uh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, we have um, these, these mutants have been isolated in several laboratories, and they have, in the meantime, all have been cloned. And, and a very interesting um, uh, result was that they all encode 
uh, membrane proteins. Membrane proteins which are involved in gap junctions, such as the connexins here, Lux and Leopard, and membrane protein, a tight junction protein is not a membrane protein, but it's involved in these type junctions which, which uh, are, are involved in, in cells interacting, communicating with, with each other. And we have uh, uh, this CR, uh, this is an immunoglobulin, uh, which we don't know much about yet, but it has a very strong spotted phenotype. And then we have a notch allele, which is also very strange. And we have a, a potassium channel. And then we have Edifix, which encodes spermidine synthase. And this is a spermidine is somehow involved in uh, catalyzing the, the uh, activity of, of connexins and, and junctions. And uh, this is quite, quite uh, striking that, that these are all proteins which serve communication between cells and interaction by transmission, small, small molecule signals between the cells. And, and at present, we are, we, are, we are working out how, how these interact with each other and how they may form the stripes, which is still a beginning topic. At the side, I just want to make a small remark. You have seen that in the iridiform mutants, the fins are untouched, they are normal, because in this case, the fins only, the fin striping involves only melanophores and xanthophores and no iridophores. So it may be a completely different mechanism. And you have also seen that in other species, the fins have different patterns, and you, one example is shown here. So we believe that in different regions of the body, the mechanisms for pattern formation are quite different. And we also observe that at the dorsum, where all three cell types are present, it is not striped. It's just spotted. They are all intermixed. And in, in the fins, you can also observe that they form uh, more stripes when the fins overgrow, whereas in the body, they don't. So this is indicating that there is a lot of environmental influence also how these cell types interact with each other to form the pattern. So the last part, very briefly, the evolution of the patterns. I've mentioned already that the closely related species have such amazingly different patterns. And the question, big question is, how do they differ and what, 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 what causes the different patterns here? And we can use these species in turn to identify the differences in these species. And this is what we are now doing, uh, looking at the um, genome sequences to, to, because they do not differ in many other respects. They're quite similar, actually, and closely related. So maybe what we find as differences may hint to us which genes are involved in, in making these uh, differences in the pigment pattern. But we have just started doing this. And we have several other methods which we apply now to explore the differences between these different species. The one is forming chimeras to see the cells which are forming different patterns in different fishes, whether they can still contribute and recognize the signals of another fish species. And then we can make, of course, CRISPR-Cas uh, knockouts to see what happens in other species, mutants of the candidate genes in other species. And we can also exchange alleles between species to test our assumptions whether some genes are involved in which process. And we have started these uh, experiments, and this is just an example. Uh, we have an unstriped uh, danio species called Schillerberbling or danio albulineatus, and this doesn't have stripes at all. But when you transplant cells from danio in albulineatus into the sepperfish rario, in this case the melanophores are marked uh, colorless with albino, you see that the dark, the dark cells, which are donor-derived, can still somehow, but not, prop, not perfectly, but they can still sort of contribute to the stripe pattern and, and recognize the signals from the other Dandereo cells. And we have similar experiments with other species. And we can do knockouts with CRISPR-Cas. This is readily done, a wonderful method, and can really help us enormously. In this case, it's just shown this unstriped species, um, and we, we knocked out the uh, uveirion, actually knocked out the albino locus, and you see here a somatic knockout in several stem cells, and you see these streaks of unpigmented albino cells in the, uh, the albuminiatus 
uh, uh, F0 in the injected fish, and you can also trace that to the germline, and then you can get clean mutants in the other species. And we have now quite a large number of mutants in Albinoniatus and also in other species. And we can also do a repair of, of genes, I mean, knock-ins, or uh, homology-directed repairs of, of uh, or, uh, genome editing, and Uwe Irion has has done that for the as a as an example for the albino gene, where you can also see these strikes of repaired cells providing uh, pigment in this albino mutant background. And this is all I wanted to tell you. And just we believe that when we when we have understood and we have not understood yet how the zebrafish makes its stripes, we probably will um, also learn a lot about uh, how other animals, basic basal animals. Um, make their patterns, uh, although I don't know whether whether we ever will understand this thing here or oh, guppies. I, this is probably easy, um, and these are also not so difficult. But these are quite quite diff difficult. And, but we think we, we probably learn something about it. We may also learn something about mammals. Uh, mammals are more simple. They have only one cell type, and they have often um, vertical stripes, and this is reminiscent of uh, the shape of our clones, which are also vertical, and this reflects the fact that the cells are distributed in a vertical manner. And it could be that in the, in the tiger, we have also two different cell types. One makes, makes brown and the other makes black. And in this case, the, the one which makes brown is mutated, and this is an albino mutant, albino, the same albino that we have in zebrafish. And this is the white tiger, and you see only the, the brown cells, uh, the brown stripes are affected, whereas the black cells are, are normal. And maybe we learn something from the zebrafish for mammals. However, I don't think we learn anything much for the peacock, and this will probably be a secret, remain a secret for a long time, maybe forever. So at last, I would like to present to you the people who did the work in the lab. So the discovery of the stem cells is based on work by Chris Dooley and Ajit Singh, who did these lineage tracing over long periods of time. Alessandro developed the Crelox system for making SOX10 clones in Zebrafish. Pratik investigated the migration and pattern formation with Xanthophores. Andre uh, worked on these spotted mutants. And Jana and Hans-Georg uh, did a lot of the genetics and clone genes and uh, isolated kept mutants. And Uwe Irion is doing these different species, the connexines, and, and also the CRISP-Cas uh, experiments in our laboratory. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>